today because they were fighting waves yesterday, creating waves and also fighting waves. That's what the hippos sometimes tend to do. But of course now the action has stopped as a youngster with its bottom out of the water. So I wonder if it wasn't just a male or it could have been a female too rolling around. It's always quite funny when the hippos do roll about and make a lot of noise. Isn't that cool though? Lots of sort of birds flying around at the moment too. Just listening to see if I can hear any different calls. I'm looking for those cutthroat finch because they are so beautiful and they like it around here. I'm just scanning as you're staring at the hippos. I haven't seen any just yet though. But you can hear lots of little tweets when the Egyptian geese are making a huge racket. You can actually hear it. That, now that very whistle-like call that's not from a kingfisher or from the Egyptian goose. That's the beautiful call of the water thickney, the bird that we had a look at just a moment ago. There's quite a few of them. I don't know what, obviously they've ruffled their feathers slightly. Unusual to hear them calling. Oh wow, look at this. Sorry, Seb, I don't know what's going on here. There's a greeting display of some sort with these water thickneys. Sorry, I just noticed that now. Uh, it was very interesting. No one really gets to spend time with these birds. Let's see if they're going to do it again. Like I said, they're not normally so active during the day, but anything is possible. But they were sort of calling, and then two approached each other, and they opened up their feathers. They fanned their tails out and opened their wings. It didn't seem to be very threatening, though, because then they sort of came quite close together and sort of their beaks clattered together. So that would mean that's not very aggressive. They're quite social birds though, they're gregarious. We do see them in large groups, but I'm sure they're monogamous though. Actually, let me check up on about that while you have a look at them. Let's quickly go to thick knees. When you go to tea, I actually don't know what their breeding cycle and all that. Let's go, yeah, water thick knee. Oh, that was quick and easy. Mm, yeah, mono they are monogamous. Okay, well that's quite cool. So that's obviously a pair over there. So maybe it was a pair that I saw. Maybe they have a nest around there. Most of these birds that live near the water's edge, and particularly the ones that live on the ground, they will make sort of shallow scrapes, just like the plovers do, just like the blacksmith lapwings do. So it'll be a very sort of basic nest. Obviously you don't want to draw too much attention to your nest if it is on the ground. You don't want it to be a beacon like what a hummercorp sort of makes. You know, they use them for territorial purposes too. It's a complete opposite. They want to try and keep their nest as hidden from all sorts of different animals or potentially the predators, the ones that would be feeding on their eggs or their young chicks. But they're quite beautiful birds. Now, CNAC, you're wondering how many different types. Oh, there's a heron. Did you see it? Just on this fallen shrub. Go a little bit to the left. It's just in there and on that shrub that's fallen in the water, that tree. And CNAC, you're sorry, you're wondering how many, of course, uh, thick knees do we get? Well, the most common ones we see. Oi, there goes a greenback heron. Where are you going to land? On an even better perch. Fantastic. Uh, we, we see the spotted thick knee and the water thick, water thick knees are the two most common. Uh, I don't think I've actually ever seen any other thick knees before. I think that could be the only ones. In fact, they are the only ones that we see in, in southern Africa. Now, that's a very cool bird. I, I saw Dylan, Brent's brother, earlier. And I said, he said, what are you, what you looking for? And I said, I'm going to look for a, a greenback heron today and watch it fish. And here we go. So we asked for the giraffe, we asked for the elephants, and now we have got our heron too. I love these birds. They're really fun to watch. I think you've got to have a lot of patience with them, though, because you can sit for ages and then really not do anything. But I love this perch, and it sits here every now and then we see it. And it's, it's taken, obviously, refuge under that tree that the hippos pulled over, but it likes this spot, too. Now, it's quite close to the water, so it's not using the technique of actually wading through the water. Notice with the greenback herons, they prefer to sort of sit on a perch and, and hunt like this. 
and they're able to stretch their necks out here, got something, and stab the water. Now, Sherry, a question about herons, and, and, and not the one that we're looking at, but about a grey heron. It's about, are the grey herons related to the great blue heron in, in America? Um, I don't know. You might find they would be in the same genus, but whether they're in the same family or not, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I haven't actually ever, I, well, I have, I've heard of the great blue herons. I've actually seen a great blue heron. I talk absolutely nonsense. So I one in the distance. But um, I haven't done much research about them, so I'm unsure. But if anybody does know, you're welcome to let us know. Please let Sherry know. Hashtag Safari Live. Let me know too. It'll be interesting to learn or, or tag me in it. And I can have a little read about it later. You're catching little insects. I can't actually really see what it's going for, but it's it's not particularly big. It's not every day that you can be successful and catch a large fish. Sometimes you have to just opt for the smaller things, you know, catch a hundred smaller things than one larger thing. Maybe you're going to use a bit more energy, but as long as you get food in your belly in the end of the day, that is the most important thing. Look at it. I love that stance, though. Legs sort of splayed wide open and I think that's a good tactic to have holding on nice and tight so that you don't lose your balance obviously if you had your feet right next to each other you would have very limited movement I suppose it's exactly how a, a, a sportsman a hockey player for example you never stand with your feet together and I don't think rugby players do the same or soccer players you're always ready to run into a gap or well you know to run after a ball of some sort what are you catching what do you think it is Seb a little insect on the surface of the water so obviously going for the same sorts of things that the blacksmith lapwing and the three-banded plover would be going for just these little insects whatever they are on the water some of them may even be little grasshoppers but of course if a little fish swims by and i think that's what this heron is hoping uh, it swims by and tries to go for one of those insects on the surface of the water it's going to go for the fish instead and you, with these smaller species of herons, they, they're quite shy. Although I think this one has seen enough vehicles and also heard a lot of noise around the lodges, which is, which is quite cool. So it's actually become quite relaxed. But it's not uncommon for these smaller species of herons to actually sort of go fishing. And, and not, not, I mean not just by sitting on a stick like this and using the, the waiting technique but by actually there's a, a fantastic video where there's a, a heron putting bread out trying to lure the fish in and I think that's so funny and so fantastic uh, able to do something like that but I think it would be very rewarding of course if this one were to catch a fish for us we didn't see the, the giant kingfisher catch anything I think we're being patient enough so it would of course be nice if that bird would make a lucky strike. See, now I don't want to go anywhere because I have a feeling it's, uh, you know, it's hit the surface of the water a few times and not come up with any too much, well, not too much. Well, maybe if we wait, we'll catch something. Now, Annabelle, you're wondering how often do green-backed herons lay eggs? Should we have a look? Because I'm not sure on that one, so I don't want to tell you stories. Let's go breeding. Let's see how how often oh, okay so they're solitary nesters firstly the monogamous mm, female builds the nest this is what I'm just reading because I'm not 100% sure about all the, obviously the breeding habits of the 850 odd bird species that we get here in southern Africa mm, let's go how often I'm, probably, I'm sure it's gonna be once a year that they will lay eggs. Let's see what well, time of the year. They've definitely got that. It's normally now, in fact. September, October, November. Actually right through till till June, but the peak seems to be sort of around November, December time. And they build their nests fairly quickly. So they won't need too much time. Let's see yeah, the incubation period is very uh, very similar to most of the birds, which is between 21 and 27 days. That's actually quite typical for a lot of the birds out here. So, Sherry and I, I'm quite confident to say that it doesn't really say if they lay eggs every year, but with such a short period, I'd say at least once a year. And then, it's quite cool. 
I'd like to find a greenback heron nest. Perhaps we'll have to start going round and round the dam, searching very carefully. But I also would like to find a water thickening nest, because that's a nest I haven't found. Now, Laurie, wondering if herons nest on the ground or in trees? Well, the gray heron and the black-headed heron, they make these beautiful platform nests. And um, so, so they nest typically up in trees. There's another one. There's another greenback heron. You see, that's why it's focused as drawn. And you hear that that was from the other heron. It's actually sitting in the sun. On the, it's coming to the edge. On the edge of the island. Sorry, Sherry, I'll get to your question now. Bless you. If you go, yeah, yeah, there we go. That branch over here, it's sitting just up a little bit higher. Uh, no, up, straight up. On there's a, you can see it actually fluttering in the light. If you zoom in, there we go. So there's another one. This must be a pair then, the two of them. Um, that's very cool, just in the sunlight there. I wonder if it's going to go and join its partner on... Maybe, actually, maybe we're going to find a nest, Sherry. Here we go. Because they do, the, the, the green herons apparently also make their nests in trees. They won't be obviously as massive as that of the the grey uh, the grain heron, the grey and the black headed heron. They're much larger. I'm just watching it, no, just having a preen. But again, they all make just a smaller version of a platform nest. So I'm just thinking, that's so why I wanted to have a look here because I thought maybe they're going to lead us to a nest. We have seen a lot of the other birds starting to prepare to lay eggs. We've seen a lot of courtship displays. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's a few when the conditions are good and the weather is warm to lay your, lay your eggs a little bit earlier. Let's see where you're going to go. You're going to dive down into the thicket there. That'll be a good spot. Lots of sort of horizontal branches and that's what you need when you want to make a platform nest. I don't think we've seen, or I have not seen two of the, the green-backed herons together. So that's nice to know. Uh, they do have a, have a mate. And they're around here. And they've moved to the island now. They used to live in the most eastern corner of the dam. And we used to see them there often. And now they've changed spots. Perhaps the fishing down that end got a bit bad. Or they're just sustain sustainable fishermen. And they don't want to exhaust all their resources in one go. And they moved on and they'll come back there in a few weeks' time.